Um, I have the pleasure of introducing the Alonquist, uh, a prospect, the prospect which makes me shudder, uh, rightfully so, because I, uh, you know, I, I don't really introduce him very well. Um, you know, I've gotten to know the Alonquist over, over uh, 15, 14 years here, and, uh, yeah, you, you get to know someone, you know, you know the, uh, the, their good side of the bed. Um, my mother always told me, don't never say anything bad about someone. Anyway, and this is like my one chance to spear you. You think I take advantage of it? Um, you know, Dale certainly is the reason why uh, there is why Chesterton is alive in, in this country and I think in the English speaking world. Um, and uh, his, his advocacy and energies and creativity and spreading the news about Chesterton, um, you know, has had remarkable. Remarkable success and facts, and therefore, you know, he doesn't really need an introduction. You know, if you haven't heard him uh, talk, then you, you, know, you, you, you know, I'm sorry, you've missed it. You know, you, and you're going to hear it today, and you're going to be charmed. And if you had have heard him talk, and you're here today to listen, I guess you'll hear him again. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was thinking maybe this led someplace profound, but it really doesn't. Um, they have, Thank you. Um, how how many of you read the talk that I gave in Buffalo on Thursday? Because I could give the same talk. <laughs> Hey, Lou, before you leave, what, what was I supposed to talk about this morning? Uh, it's just isms. Isms, okay. Yeah, you know, usually I, it's the 13th conference that I've spoken at, and usually I've been the last speaker. Yeah. The last shall be first today. And the, the thing about being the last speaker is I always had a little more time to figure out what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> or or I, and then I did also sleep during the earlier talks, <laughs> and now I have to sleep through my own talk, which is, which is actually kind of a pleasure. So, um, I just, uh, this last summer, had a great privilege of uh, going on a Catholic Answers cruise to the British Isles. My wife and I uh, enjoyed uh, 12 days with some wonderful people and saw and did some, some marvelous things. And, we visited Scotland and made several stops in Scotland. And we visited uh, Stirling, in, in, right in, uh, in the center of uh, northern Scotland there, and uh, visited Stirling Castle, where uh, Mary, Queen of Scots, was, was born. And also where she was crowned queen, which I think happened when she was one year old. Um, and uh, but she, she grew up in this castle and lived there. Uh, and it's, it's beautifully restored. One of the highlights uh, of, the, uh, of the castle is her chambers, which are uh, where hang the, uh, the tapestries that, that are exact replicas of the original tapestries of the hunting of the unicorn. Uh, now, you have to ask yourself, okay, these are exact replicas of the originals. Does anybody know where the originals hang? I'm in, in Paris. In, I'm trying to think of the name of the place. Um, the Clooney Museum. No. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> the Cloisters Square. New York City. New York City. Oh. Yeah, the, the, the originals hang in New York City. Oh. I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> I mean, France makes a little more sense, yeah. In fact, they, the originals did hang in France for a while. Um, but the question is, how did they end up in New York City? The answer is going to be given in my talk this morning. <laughs> okay? 
and it, it, it relates to the subject. I, I hope if <laughs> if, uh, if I got the right ism here. <laughs> Chesterton says that the uh, the Reformation came. Ireland went Catholic, Scotland went Protestant, and England went something or other. <laughs> I love that explanation. Um, and uh, Chesterton himself uh, kind of started out something or other, but when the time came, he, uh, he became, he did not go Protestant, he went Catholic. Uh, and his, but his perspective about the Scotch is, is quite interesting because he himself was a quarter Scotch, that's why his middle name is Keith. And uh, he considers the Scotch romantic people, which is sort of the, the last thing you, you think of when <laughs> of the Scots is romantic. But he considers them romantic. Uh, the, the Scott, Joseph and I were talking about the, the reputation that, that uh, each of the, uh, the, the British countries have. And, and what did you say the Scots' reputation was that they were mean? mean. <laughs> <laughs> That's mean. Whereas Chesterton talks about them, well, I guess our question is, is that they're, they're slow-witted. We, we, yeah, no, no. no the, the, Irish are, the Irish are famous for their Irish bull, which is, you know, the, it's, it's hereditary in his family to not have children. That, that sort of thing. You know? <laughs> right. and, and it's the hope of dying that keeps me alive. <laughs> Irish bull. Whereas the Scottish, the, the, the gentleman from Scotland went and visited his friend in England. And the, the Englishman had a dog. And the Englishman had a dog, and the Scottish gentleman said, well, What's your dog's name? And the Englishman said, Hardware. Why is his name Hardware? Well, because every time I yell at him, he makes a bolt for the door. <laughs> So the Scottish man went back to Scotland and a week later and he said, you know, I visited my friend in England last week and his dog had the most unusual name, Hardware. Why was his name Hardware? Well, because every time he yells at him, the dog runs outside. <laughs> How, how do you make an old Scotsman laugh? You, you tell him a joke when he's a young Scotsman. <laughs> <laughs> but Chesterton considers them a romantic people, and he defines romance as that, that need for the mixture of the familiar and the unfamiliar the natural kinship between war and wooing. Uh, in literature, romanticism is, is a mood that combines to the keenest extent the idea of danger and the idea of hope. In a word, adventure. And uh, uh, he calls romance a state of the soul. For some dark and elemental reason which we can never understand, this state of the soul is evoked in us by the sight of certain places, or the contemplation of certain human crises, by a stream rushing under a heavy and covered wooden bridge, or by a man plunging a knife or a sword into tough timber. And the writers who best catch the spirit of romance, as in a net, are the Scottish writers. Sir Walter Scott, Robert Louis Stevenson, writers of adventure and romance. And those are the writers that Chesterton grew up with. They, they, these were the, the food and the, the drink of, of, that, he, that he read. Uh, we associate uh, romance and adventure with pirates, fighting pirates, finding buried treasure, and we should. But the real adventure is an internal affair. Uh, romance shows up in the externals, but it, it is a state of the soul. Uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnapped and Treasure Island 
They're great adventure stories, but Stevenson's most compelling adventure story is the strange case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And Jekyll and Hyde is a, is a thing that we think we understand, a, a story we think we all know about, the man who splits himself into two men, one good, one evil. And Chesterton points out that's, that's not what happens. He says the real stab of the story is not in the discovery that one man is two men, but in the discovery that two men are one man. After all, the diverse wandering and warring of these two incompatible beings, there was still only one man born and one man buried. Jekyll and Hyde had become a proverb and a joke, only it's a proverb read backwards and a joke nobody really sees. The point of the story is not that a man can cut himself off from his conscience, but that he cannot. The reason is that there is never an equality between good and evil. Jekyll played with danger when he unleashed evil. Jekyll created Hyde, but Hyde could never have created Jekyll. He could only destroy Jekyll. Evil does not create anything. Evil can only destroy. So Chesterton says the Scotch are romantic, but they embarked on a great adventure a scheme that unleashed a really, truly great evil on the modern world. It was dangerous, but it was romantic. It seemed worth the risk. It was, it was the Industrial Revolution. And uh, Chesterton says how the Scots are always known for having an eye for business. He says Cyclops had an eye for business. <laughs> It was in the middle of his forehead. It served him admirably for the only two duties which are demanded in a modern financier and a captain of industry, the two duties of counting sheep and eating men. <laughs> the Scots accepted the industrial civilization with its factory chimneys, its famine prices, with its steam and smoke and steel and strikes. You need to be very romantic to accept an industrial civilization. The industrial dream suited the Scots. Here was a really romantic vista, suited to a romantic people, a vision of higher and higher chimneys taking hold upon the heavens, of fiercer and fiercer fires. Here were taller and taller engines that began already to shriek and gesticulate like giants. Here were thunderbolts of communication, which already flashed to and fro like thoughts. The dreamy, romantic Scott could not be expected to stand still in such a whirl of wizardry and not believe that he would be richer. They were tempted by the enormous but unequal opportunities of industrialism because they are romantic. But the industrial cities of Scotland, Chesterton says, did not become rich. They became poor cities with a few rich men. So adventure means risk and reward. It also means risk and failure. Some would say that the Industrial Revolution that grew out of Scotland was a great success. Chesterton would argue it was a great failure. And the Catholic Church would agree. And if you disagree, read Rerum No Pope Leo the 13th Encyclical from 1891 on the working classes where he recognizes that industrialism did not set people free. Rather, it created a new kind of slavery and a, a pitiful wage slavery and urban ruin and new kinds of societal ills that the world really hadn't seen before. All festering, heavily populated cities where people suddenly clustered around the factories. And these problems were caused by industrial capitalism and they were obvious Pope Leo cautioned that the wrong solution to these problems was socialism, because that was the only thing we offered as a solution. He argued that the right solution was a more widespread ownership, that workers should become owners. And this was the basis of Catholic social teaching and of Chesterton's own ideas on economics and politics, which came to be called distributism. 
Ownership means independence, which means freedom, which means responsibility. We forget that capitalism was originally known as individualism, which is why socialism is called socialism, because it was a reaction against individualism. The basic unit of society is, is not the individual or the community, it's the family, and that's Chesterton's great insight. But we forget <coughs> who was the architect of modern capitalism. It was a Scotchman. It was Adam Smith. And his book, The Wealth of Nations, is basically the manifesto of capitalism. And we also forget that Adam Smith was a Scottish Presbyterian. Church of Scotland is Presbyterian. As a Scot, he was romantic, but he also had an eye for business. <laughs> As a Presbyterian, he was a Calvinist, and the essence of that is predestination. And his approach to economics is every bit as materialistic as Karl Marx's. And when I say materialist, I mean determinist. <laughs> There's no room for free will. The market is a machine that simply works without, it's, it's free will that screws up the machine. Just like Karl Marx realized that religion screws up his plan. His plan. Uh, Chesterton says, Scotland has that double dose of poison called heredity, the sense of blood in the aristocrat, and the sense of doom in the Calvinist. There's a white flame which marks the eternal fanatic in every Scotchman. They are the race of the suddenly converted. He says they claim uh, the, the cross of St. Andrew as their, uh, as, as their symbol, the X. Uh, but he says the, uh, they, they believe that St. Andrew was a Scotsman and also a Presbyterian. <laughs> And, and then, you know, of course, with, with uh, that form of Protestantism rising out of Calvinism, uh, the Bible becomes the new authority over the church. It's, which is a classic heresy of taking one idea from the deposit of truth from the Catholic Church, and just taking that one idea and exalting that one idea above all, all of the, uh, the truths in the church. The Bible certainly is true but it's not the only truth. And uh, Chesterton, of course, has a great line of, of he, he said, I can understand someone seeing a Catholic procession going by, and the bells and the smells and the crucifix and the robes and the priests and the scrolls, and saying, it's all wash. What I can't understand is someone seeing the same procession going by and saying, it's all wash except for the scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> and that's basically the doctrine of uh, the dogma of soul scroll scripture. <laughs> so predestination is a problem. But the real problem for Chesterton from the Scotch Presbyterians is Puritanism, which is what my talk is supposed to be about. <laughs> How are we doing for time here? I think I'm just about done. Hey. <laughs> I had, lots, I had a lot to say about Puritanism, too. <laughs> Lou's not here, so I'll just keep going. <laughs> yeah, uh, Chesterton says that the, the Puritanism is epitomized by the Scottish Sabbath, which is basically uh, the idea of, of no work is interpreted to mean also no play. Uh, he says, the Scottish work week is six days of avarice and one day of fear. <laughs> <laughs> Chesterton says, the Puritans do not understand frivolity. Um, they really believe that you can have too much of a good thing. And, and Chesterton says, that doctrine is, is an attack on a doctrine of eternal life. You can have too much of a good thing. You can have more of a good thing than you can even comprehend, which is what heaven is. 
Um, but they they believe um, that that uh, normal pleasures are bad, and they attack normal pleasures that God has given us. Um, paganism really preserved the human things, and the church preserved pa the, the pagan things that were the human things. It, it christened paganism by preserving those human things, which are the altar, the physical worship, elaborate ceremony, wine, music, festival, holy smoke. <laughs> Puritanism rejected all the things that Catholicism saved in, in paganism. Chesterton def defines Puritanism as righteous indignation about the wrong things. <laughs> you can say indignation about the things that don't matter. Paganism, on the other hand, tends to flow towards a devotion to things that ultimately don't matter. So both have an unbalanced view of the material world. Puritanism is is, is, uh, is legalism, whereas paganism becomes license. They both lack common sense. The Puritan tries to make innocent things seem guilty. The pagan tries to make guilty things seem innocent. And what they have in common is they really are both reactions, ultimately, against the, the balance of the Catholic faith, which is the creed that protect, pr protects truth and liberty. Chesterton says, a, mind, a man's minor actions ought to be free, flexible, creative, the things that should be unchangeable are his principles, his ideas, his ideals. But with us, the reverse is true. Our views change constantly, but our lunch does not change. <laughs> what the records of the medieval system really did practically and in the long run was to let loose some of the vices on the excuse of exterminating others. After the Renaissance, the pagans went in for unlimited lust, the Puritans for unlimited avarice, on the excuse that at least none of them was guilty of sloth. Uh, the, the new paganism is, is not a return, but a decline. It's a decadence. The old pagans really had clear ideas that could be stated as a, as a train of thought. The moderns who call themselves pagans really have no connected theory of life that can be explained. The old pagans had a reverence for nature. They understood that there was some great force behind it. They were, as Chester says, the few who could actually take nature naturally. But, uh, but the new pagans worship nature itself, apart from God. And as Chester says, take away the supernatural, what remains is the unnatural. Uh, the, the, uh, the old pagans may have had an emphasis on sex, but, but the new pagans, um, uh, the emphasis is on sex without fertility. Uh, it exalts lust, but forbids fertility, which is very unnatural. The thing is, it's natural to worship, but if you don't worship the true God, you will worship something else. And you will un end up worshiping something unnatural. And the reaction against this, which will lead to a decadence, the reaction against this is always in danger of overreacting, which is what Puritanism is. It's an overreaction. It's not, Chester says that it's hard to correct an exaggeration without ex exaggerating the correction. And that's what Puritanism is. Um, it became a hatred of everything natural, of everything normal. The Scotch people before Scotland existed, existed were a curious lot, says Chester. In fact, they were, they're a curious lot still. But in the prehistoric times, I fancy they really did worship demons. And that's why they jumped at Puritan theology. He says, we, we've taken away, we, we were re, reliving the story of, the, of Christ casting out the demons but we've left out the Redeemer and it just kept the demons in the swine. Now, I, I said that I was going to explain why those tapestries, tapestries ended up in New York, right? The, the answer is in the, the church that's right next to the Sterling Castle. It's called the Church of the Holy Rood, which means holy wood. 
I mean, in other words, peace of the true cross. And uh, it was a, just a beautiful Catholic church until the Scotch Presbyterians took it over. Now it's sort of a shell of what it was. And we, we, we took a wonderful tour, we looked around all the stuff there, and uh, we got into a conversation with a well-dressed gentleman who uh, had a uh, tag that said, Ministry of Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was asking about the history of the Church of Scotland and how it differed from the Church of England, and he pointed out that, well, the Church of, of, of England, they, they, they start for political reasons, really. Whereas the Church of Scotland started for religious reasons. And that was, that was a good explanation because, as we know, the Church of England was because Henry VIII uh, wanted to become the head of the church so he could get a divorce and uh, get a, a new wife. Uh, the Church of Scotland started because John Knox wanted to replace the authority of the, uh, of the Catholic Church. And, uh, and they, they came in with a, a very puritanical approach and they started cutting heads off of uh, statues, <laughs> beheading statues and destroying statues, destroying any of the beautiful Christian art. Because, well, the answer was explained in a, uh, I was, uh, On the side of the, of the church was a kind of an arched opening, and it was called the Easter Sepulchre. And uh, there's a sign on the wall next to it that says, the Easter Sepulchre is a very rare feature. In the Middle Ages, it was regarded as the most holy place after the high altar in the whole church. For Good Friday, it would be decorated with flowers and foliage, among which an image of the crucified Christ was laid. Then on Easter Sunday, the resurrection of our Lord would be celebrated in the Easter Mass. Then comes the great line. The Reformation swept such ceremonial aside and relied on preaching to teach the faith. In other words, nothing about worship should appeal to the senses. Chesterton says, the Puritan believes it's better to worship in a barn than in a cathedral for the specific reason that the cathedral is beautiful. <laughs> the physical beauty is a false and sensual symbol coming in between the intellect and the object of its intellectual worship. This is the essential Puritan idea that God can only be praised with your brain. It's wicked to praise him with your passions or your physical habits or your gestures or instincts of beauty. Therefore, it is wicked to worship by singing or dancing or drinking sacramental wines or building beautiful churches or repeating magnificent prayers. We must not worship by dancing, drinking, building, or singing. We can only worship by thinking. Our heads can praise God, but never our hands or our feet. And this is actually why, after the Reformation, when the Church of Scotland took over Stirling Castle, they tore down the tapestries that were hanging in the Queen's chambers. And they literally threw them on a dung heap. And they were rescued by some Catholics who then brought them to France, where they, they hang they hang in a royal palace for many years. Until, ironically, a Puritan by the name of John D. Rockefeller <laughs> <laughs> bought them for a million dollars and brought them to America. Uh, but, but what is the hunting of the unicorn about? Does anybody know? It's an allegory of the passion of Christ. The unicorn represents Christ. And this is, was led by a, a virgin, obviously who represents uh, Mary. And it was one of the things that was beautiful, that was allegorical, that the Puritans rejected and literally, <coughs> literally threw away into a dung heap. Then they had to go through the elaborate procedure of making an exact replica of them so they could hang them up again. 
the tourists to see. One of the things I asked the uh, Ministry of Welcome guy was, I said, what did you do with the, with the piece of the uh, True Cross that used to be here? And this was a question that obviously no one had ever asked him before. <laughs> he said, well, if you believe that sort of thing. He said, well, you know, the, the, the problem was that you know, after the Reformation, we inherited all these churches. <laughs> you know, yeah, they just came upon these churches. They didn't know what to do with them. They got rid of all that stuff in them. Like pieces of the the true cross. Um, these things are, had to be saved by the by the Catholics. I guess there's an allegory in that too. I'm done. <laughs>